Hello everyone and welcome to another webinar. This one hosted once again by XRite. Thank you to XRite for hosting today's webinar where I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, targeted adjustments in Photoshop. Any of you who've been following me for any period of time know that I'm a bit of a control freak when it comes to my photos and a big part of that is being able to apply adjustments that affect specific areas of a photo. And today I'm going to share some of my top tips I'll move a little bit quickly through some of the various techniques and mostly to give you a sense of what's possible, some tips along the way, and some techniques that you can employ with your own photos. And I should mention before we dive in, many of the techniques that I'm going to be covering today are also covered in a couple of video courses. So if you want to learn even more about selections in the Gray Learning Video Training Library, we have a course on mastering selections in Photoshop. There's also a course on targeted adjustments. There's, in fact, an additional course on adjustments in general in, in Photoshop, and all that's available through the Gray Learning website. So we do have an Everything Bundle. If you're already a subscriber to the Everything Bundle, you already have access to all of that, all of those courses, but the individual courses are available individually as well. All right, so let's dive into targeted adjustments in Photoshop. I'm going to start off with some techniques that actually do not involve what most photographers think of when they think about targeted adjustments. If photographers have any notion of what Photoshop is capable, when they think about targeted adjustments, they're usually thinking about layer masks. I promise I will share some of my favorite techniques related to layer masking a little bit later today. But first, I want to show you some possibilities that relate to not using a layer mask, but still applying targeted adjustments. So we can apply adjustments that affect specific areas of the image without having to create a layer mask. So let me show you a few examples here. We're going to start off with a hue saturation adjustment. I'll go ahead and, as always, use an adjustment layer. So at the bottom of the layers panel, I have this half black, half white circle icon that allows me to create a new adjustment layer. If I click that button, then I can choose the type of adjustment layer that I would like to add. And I'm going to use the hue saturation adjustment. One of the things that I've found many photographers have sort of struggled a little bit with hue saturation, I think they've sort of given up on hue saturation because it seems that it just doesn't provide much of what they might need for a photographic image. If I adjust the hue slider, for example, I get some really wild interpretations of the photo, perhaps some interesting, oh, almost color infrared type of effect in some cases. If I adjust saturation, I can get some rather ridiculous colors, potentially, as well as some muted or even grayscale tones. But that's not the best way to adjust the overall saturation. And then lightness, I often describe this as spilling white paint onto your photo or spilling black paint onto your photo. Not that it doesn't have its uses, but there can be some inherent challenges as well. So that seems like the hue, saturation, lightness sliders, not the most valuable controls in Photoshop. And I would agree with that. However, they are useful when we're targeting specific colors. And that does not require me to create a layer mask. I can simply choose a color and change it. So by default, with the hue saturation adjustment, if you take a look on my properties panel here, you'll see that we're adjusting the master image. What that really means is we're affecting the entire image, all colors in the photo, but I can choose which colors I would like to focus on. So for example, I could choose the yellows option from the pop-up, and now the hue, saturation, and lightness sliders are only affecting the yellows. So I can turn these into Japanese maple trees with no time at all. Just a very, very simple effect to change the color. Now, of course, notice that I'm changing all areas of yellow, in this case, within the photo. So I can't target this effect geographically, you might say, I'm causing all yellow pixels, no matter where they might appear in the image, to be shifted toward red. Well, that can be lots of fun and creative and interesting and wild, and that's all well and good, but what are we going to do in the real world? Well, I actually might want to make changes to individual colors in the real world. I generally think of the hue slider in this context as a color balance adjustment for a single color in the photo. So 
in many cases I might find that the sky in my image wasn't rendered quite the way I'd like it so I can go to the blues channel to affect only the blue areas in the photo and I can shift that sky toward a more cobalt value or bring it back toward a more cyan value or make it look like an incredibly weird sunset or you know, whatever the case might be point being is that I can shift those colors. Now generally I would do that in a relatively modest way. I just want a little bit more of a sense of a cobalt polarized sky or I want a little bit more of a kind of realistic cyan sky. Obviously I could fine tune the overall saturation of those areas as well. Again, keeping in mind that because I'm working on the blues, I'm affecting all blue pixels within the photo. Of course, there's an even more nitpicky possibility here when it comes to optimizing color. And this is one of the things that I try to encourage photographers about when it comes to working with their images is to really critically evaluate their photos. In fact, I started talking about this so much, I decided I need to make a whole video course just on evaluating photos. And so that is a course that talks about all these various techniques related to evaluating your photo. And part of that is knowing what those techniques are, but part of it is also taking the time to really scrutinize your image. So as you're working on your image, I think of this as sort of top down or biggest problem first type of editing. What's my biggest issue? Well, I want to open up some shadow detail. I want to correct the color balance. I want to get a little bit more contrast whatever the case might be, but then starting to nitpick a little bit. Oh, I want the clouds to be a little bit darker. And in the context of color, one of the issues that I run into is that we find sometimes colors we don't really like in the image. I'm going to zoom in on an area of the photo here, and just so that we can see what's going on, I'm going to add a hue saturation adjustment and crank up the saturation. And you can see that in the background here, there's lots of magenta. If I turn off that hue saturation adjustment just by clicking the eyeball icon to the left of the layer itself, the adjustment layer on the layers panel, I can enable or disable that adjustment. And even now you might be able to tell it's a little bit subtle to be sure, but if you pay close attention to your photos, you'll notice these subtle little details. It's a little pinkish in that area. Now, of course, the overall photo has these reddish, orangish, yellow tones, all those warm tones. So the magenta isn't exactly out of place, but I find it a little bit bothersome, and so I would like to resolve it. I'd like to essentially get rid of that magenta. So I'm going to zoom in once again, and now switch to the magenta's slider, and in or, or the magenta's channel, I should say, color, and then I'll crank up the saturation. So now I am boosting the saturation for only the magentas. Well, sort of. Because in this case, Photoshop's idea of magenta isn't exactly aligned with my idea of magenta. You can see I have some reddish areas in the rock that are being included in my adjustment, and I have some more kind of bluish, purplish areas back in here as well that I might not want to affect. And so if you take a look at the bottom of the properties panel, you'll see that, yes, of course, I've selected magentas as my color channel, if you will. But Photoshop is also showing me an indication of which range of colors will actually be affected by my adjustment. These vertical bars here identify the range of colors that will be completely affected by my adjustment. So any colors that fall in between are being completely affected. The transition, the tapering off of my adjustment continues until we get to the color defined by this trapezoid out on the outside, one on each side of course. I could shift the overall construct here. Maybe I want to work with the reds instead of the magentas. I can shift by dragging at the very center in between those vertical bars. I can also tighten up that transition. So notice if I open up the transition, I get more reds. If I tighten it up, I get fewer reds. And then I can point my mouse in between the vertical bar and the trapezoid to fine tune that overall range, keeping the transition unaffected. So I'll go ahead and position this oh, right about there. Looks pretty good. And then I'll fine tune over on the blue. And I'm going to keep that transition relatively tight. 
and just tighten up. I don't want to lose all of those blues, but just a little bit in that range. Of course, I also want to zoom out and make sure that I don't have, oh, I don't know, maybe some magenta flowers in my foreground that I would be altering in a way that was not intended. So again, keeping in mind that at the moment I'm adjusting every pixel in the image that has this specific range of magenta color values, and so I'll want to be careful that that is the intended result, and if not, then I'll want to think about targeted adjustments with a layer mask, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So now I've defined that color, and again, using that exaggerated adjustment, in this case, boosting the saturation completely so that I can better see exactly where in the image I'm causing an adjustment, and then I can, of course, once I've defined the correct range of colors, I can reduce the saturation in this case, or shift the hue, but here I think I want to reduce saturation. Of course, not completely because that would give me gray rock. I just want to tone it down so that things blend in a little bit better, maybe right about there. I'll turn off my adjustment and turn it back on again. Maybe that's a little bit too strong. I'll loosen that up just a little bit, have less of a reduction in saturation. That looks better. And again, the key here is not only to understand how hue saturation works and how we can focus our adjustments on specific colors, but also to scrutinize our images to make sure that we're focusing on every little detail. Essentially, I, I like to feel, sort of, not really, <laughs> but I like to feel like I'm never finished with my photo, that there's always something more I can do. At some point, I need to say, okay, it's finished, I'm making a print and hanging it on the wall, but the point is that we want to really make sure that we're paying attention to all of the various details in our photos. Another adjustment that I absolutely love, and that you might not immediately think of as a targeted adjustment, is the curves adjustment. This is one that has a tendency to intimidate photographers a little bit. It is a slightly complicated adjustment, but let's see if we can't simplify that a little bit. I will once again add an adjustment layer, this time naturally, choosing curves from that pop-up. And you can see on the properties panel, I have, well, I don't have a curve, actually. I have a straight line that goes from the bottom left to the top right. That represents my starting point, essentially. The curve adjustment is sort of a before and after adjustment. The gradient down at the bottom represents my luminance values, the before values, and the gradient on the left represents my after values. And so if we follow from middle gray on the before gradient, move straight up until we come into contact with the curve, then move directly to the left, we see that the after value is exactly the same as the before value because we have that 45 degree line. If I drag that curve upward, literally just drag it upward, I'm brightening the image because I'm moving upward on that after gradient. If I drag downward, then I'm darkening the image. If I make the curve more steep, so for example, I'll just bring my white point in and then bring my black point in. I've got a much steeper line here and you can see much more contrast as well. So more steepness equals more contrast. I can also naturally reduce contrast. So less steepness gives me less contrast. But what's really special about the curves adjustment is that I can apply these adjustments to specific ranges of tonal values in the image. You can see that I have a histogram displayed here. And with a little thought, we can figure out what's going on with our histogram. Over on the far left, of course, we have the dark areas. On the right, we have the bright areas. So it doesn't take very long to figure out that this big chunk over here on the right-hand side represents the clouds. And the windmills, probably right over here in the dark range. And so if I want to focus an adjustment, a tonal adjustment on specific tonal values in the image, I can simply work on specific areas of the curve. So let's say I wanted to brighten up my shadow detail. I could come down to the dark end of the curve, click right on the curve itself, and then drag that curve upward. That creates a handle, essentially, that I'm able to use to change the shape of the curve. And I'm pulling that curve upward in order to brighten up the shadows. Of course, it doesn't take more than a split second to realize that I'm affecting the entire image, but that's because I've pulled the entire curve upward. I've sort of emphasized my adjustment down here in the shadows, but the whole curve is being affected. The overall shape of the curve, well, I can just grab that curve and pull it to where I want it. And so, for example, maybe I want to normalize the shape of the rest of the curve to some extent and then make sure that I'm only affecting uh, 
those dark shadow areas. So by adding additional anchor points, just clicking on the curve and adjusting that overall shape, I can make sure that I'm keeping the rest of the curve relatively unchanged, for example, so that my, in this case, tonal adjustment that is focused on the shadows is really only focused on the shadows. Maybe I want to brighten up those shadows just a tiny little bit. Right about there is looking pretty good. And then I could have a similar effect on the highlights. So, for example, dragging those highlights down in order to darken the highlights and then normalizing the rest of the curve. Just essentially dragging that curve around. Obviously, in this case, I'm getting a little bit exaggerated with that movement to illustrate the concept, but I'm able to drag that curve around to focus my adjustments on specific areas of the photo. Okay, so I see we have a question about the previous image. Where did that magenta come from in the first place? And I assume that means in the actual photo. So if you'll recall with this image here, we had some magenta back in there. Some of that is the natural tones in the rocks, but a big part of that is actually atmospheric haze. So if you're an outdoor a landscape photographer, you'll very often find that in the distance where there's any haze in the atmosphere, the scattering of light will create a little bit of a magenta color in those areas. All right, so wrapping up with tone in curves, again, you can see, obviously, I've had a little bit of an overly strong effect on the image here. I'd want to tone that down a little bit, and that is one of the key lessons of curves. A little goes a long way, so just very small movements of the curve, but that enables you to have a good, high-quality, but high control adjustment over the image. You can really exercise tremendous control over specific tonal values. But perhaps even more valuable is that using curves, we can actually affect the colors as well. So the curves adjustment, if you, as you've seen, is really focused on being a tonal adjustment, but we can do the same thing with color. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we can adjust color balance for the highlights versus the shadows, for example, differently. So with this photo, I've got a little bit too much yellow in the bright areas, and I've got a little too much blue in the dark areas down here, I think, and so I'd like to shift the color balance, except yellow and blue are opposite colors. So if I adjust the overall color balance so that the Duomo here has a better color, less yellow in it, then I'm going to also cause the areas that are shadow in this case, the darker areas, I'm going to cause them to have more blue because yellow and blue are opposite. So if I shift toward blue to get rid of the yellow, now I'm making my shadows more blue, which is the opposite of what I wanted. Thank goodness we have curves. But again, the curves adjustment by default is a tonal adjustment, but we can choose a specific color channel to make it a color adjustment instead of a tonal adjustment. So in this case, I mentioned I want to work on the blue channel because I know what my opposite colors are, red versus cyan, green versus magenta, and blue versus yellow. So if I choose the blue channel, now I can shift my balance between more blue and more yellow, or less blue and less yellow, or more blue, however you want to think about it we can go back and forth affecting the color balance. But just as we saw previously, we can focus that adjustment on specific tonal ranges in the image. So I'll make a bit of an exaggerated adjustment here just so we can better see what's going on. I'm trying to focus my adjustment on the highlight areas to shift those yellows toward blue to get a more neutral result in the Duomo. But you can see that I'm affecting the entire image but if I come down toward my shadow areas and drag the curve downward in the shadows, I can actually shift the shadows toward more of a yellow value. Does that mean that I get golden late afternoon light in the shadows? No, of course not. It just means that I'm shifting closer to yellow, but this is a sort of continuous transition from blue to yellow. So eventually I could get really yellow in those dark shadow values, but I'm really just trying to compensate a little bit. So I'm going to bring more blue into the highlights and a little bit more yellow into the shadows. I'm having the opposite color balance adjustment based on tonal values. So highlights versus shadows in this case. I can of course kind of fine tune that overall adjustment, maybe a little bit more blue for the highlights and maybe a little 
touch more yellow for the shadows, maybe not quite that strong, and then fine tune accordingly. But again, the point being is that I can use that curves adjustment to target my, as we saw with the previous image, tonal adjustments, but also, as we've seen right here, my color adjustments so that they only affect specific areas of the image based on tonality. So highlights versus shadows, for example, light areas versus dark areas, mid-tones versus the brightest areas, etc. Now sometimes I like to go a little bit further and apply a targeted adjustment that is darkening certain areas, lightening certain areas, but based on the subject matter of the photo, not just based on the darkest versus the brightest values, for example. So I want to maybe lighten up the tree, but darken up the wheat in the foreground in this photo. So that calls for a targeted adjustment. In other words, I can't just use curves because curves doesn't have a tree mode and a wheat mode. It's just based on luminance values in the photo. But I also don't necessarily need a layer mask. I can actually just paint with light and dark directly into the image. And that calls for a dodging and burning technique. There are actually dodge and burn tools that you can find over on the toolbox here. But I tend not to use those. I like to use a different technique that involves a special layer and the brush tool. So I want a new layer. Of course, I want to work non-destructively. Conceptually, I would want an adjustment layer here. But for this technique, it calls for a variation on that. I'm actually going to add an image layer. And so I'll click on this blank sheet of paper icon down at the bottom of the layers panel. That's the create a new layer button. But I'm not simply going to click on that layer. I want to assign special properties to this layer. So I'm going to hold the Alt key on Windows or the Option key on Macintosh while clicking on the Create New Layer button. And that will bring up the New Layer dialog. I can give the layer a name, which I highly recommend to make sure that you're never confused about why you added a particular layer. So we'll call this Dodge and Burn, a very creative name for our layer. And then the most important thing here is that I want to change the mode. This is the blend mode. This determines how this layer will interact with the underlying layer. The normal blend mode will cause anything that I paint on this layer to simply cover up whatever's underneath. Instead, I want this layer to interact with the underlying layer, essentially adding contrast. So I'm going to choose one of the contrast blend modes. I use overlay for this purpose. And then I like to turn on this checkbox, the fill with overlay neutral color, 50% gray. This is optional, but I find it very helpful for sort of evaluating this layer, figuring out exactly where I've painted to lighten versus darken the image. I'll go ahead and click OK to create that new layer. And then I'll come over to the toolbox and choose my brush tool. And then up on the options bar, make sure that my hardness value is set to 0%. I want to use a soft edged brush. Note that the blend mode up on the options bar is set to normal. The magic is happening over on the layer with my overlay blend mode for my dodge and burn layer. I'll leave the mode set to normal for the brush itself. And then I can adjust the brush size as needed with the left and right square bracket keys on the keyboard, left square bracket to reduce the brush size, right square bracket to increase the brush size. And then I'll press the letter D as in default colors, so that, as you can see at the bottom of my toolbox, I have black and white, the default values for my colors. At any time, I can press the letter X on the keyboard to X change or switch between black and white. So black will darken, white will lighten because of my overlay blend mode. If I wanted to darken up that foreground, for example, I could paint with black, and if I wanted to lighten up the tree, I could paint with white, but oh my God, goodness, what a strong effect I'm having, and that's because I'm painting at a 100% opacity. So this is essentially the strongest result that I could produce with this dodging and burning technique. I don't think we ever need quite that strong of an adjustment, and so I will reduce that opacity setting, usually somewhere around 10 or 15%, no more, I would say, than about 20%, so that we can see it a little bit easier here. I'll set that value to 20%, Note, by the way, that when we're working with the brush tool, this opacity setting on the options bar can be set very quickly and easily using keyboard shortcuts. One on the keyboard will give you 10%, two gives you 20%, a quick one five gives you 15%. And then I can come into the image and I'll adjust my brush size here a little bit and then I can paint a little bit of a lightning effect, opening up some of the shadow detail in the trees, 
and then switching to black once again by pressing the letter X on the keyboard increasing my brush size I can paint just a little bit of darkening into the wheat in the foreground at any time if I want to sort of evaluate my work see where I've been painting I can turn off the visibility for the background image layer on the layers panel so that I can see the actual dodge and burn layer and as I mentioned I filled this layer with middle gray which makes it a lot easier to actually see where I've been painting where I've been lightening and darkening in case I need to get back and you know fix a little problem that I had for example uh, and then I see there was a question by the way a really good question related to applying targeted adjustments using those adjustment layers and specifically can you reset an adjustment some of you might have caught me resetting adjustments as I was working just to kind of get back to a basic starting point after demonstrating something but let me show you that really quickly I'm gonna go ahead and click and add an adjustment layer and we'll add a curves adjustment and maybe I just wanted to enhance overall contrast for example but then I got a little bit out of control here and created a wild effect and I just want to start over down at the bottom of my properties panel there's this backward curving arrow and that resets the adjustment now if I had made an adjustment and then went to a different layer and came back to my curves adjustment in this case and applied an additional adjustment then that undo actually gives me two steps so I could click once to go back to the previous interpretation if you will of the photo and click one more time to reset to the overall default values all right so that gives us a pretty good foundation I think I hope when it comes to working with some targeted adjustments that don't require a layer mask but now let's dive in to layer masks and I know this is a topic that many photographers have struggled with they find the concepts to be very abstract a little bit hard to grasp I want to try and simplify the overall concepts related to a layer mask when we're using a layer mask it's a very fancy word but it's such a simple concept you're also I'm sure familiar with the concept of selections maybe you know about alpha channels perhaps you know about quick mask mode these are all the same thing they are all really just ways of defining a stencil which area of the image do you want to affect versus which area do you not want to affect so when we want to apply an adjustment that can't be constrained accurately based on luminance values or color values then we can start to define a stencil for the image I want to affect in this case the Sun but not the sky or I want to affect the sky but not the Sun alpha channels quick mask mode selections layer masks these are all ways of telling Photoshop which area of the image we want to work on someday in the future I will be able to say Photoshop please darken the Sun just a little bit and Photoshop will do that but until then we need to define our own stencils so let's go ahead and define a stencil here I'll just use the brush tool and for our purposes I'll just use a hard edged brush and I will paint with white I am using a separate layer but don't worry about the specifics of how I'm working at the moment just try to focus on the concept itself I love working with this photo by the way because then it reminds me of how round the Sun is not especially as it's setting and we get that sort of lens effect with the atmosphere so I have just painted to define the Sun that's very easy and I'm just going to use a quick little trick here to fill the rest of the image with my background color and that would be black of course and so now I have although it doesn't look like that went black I'm checking my settings here everything looks fine we'll assume that's true black in any event I've now defined a stencil so I now have a white area defining the Sun and a black area defining everything else in the image this is my stencil for all intents and purposes this is a selection this is quick mask mode this is an alpha channel this is a layer mask because this is actually how Photoshop represents all of those things it just doesn't necessarily present those things in this way a selection for example is typically displayed as that animated line those marching ants that define the edge the boundary of my selection or in quick mask mode we get a colored overlay identifying areas that are not selected well this is really what Photoshop is using in the background so think 
of all of these things, selections, layer masks, and all the variations on those themes, think of them as a simple stencil where white means do something to this area and black means don't do anything to this other area. So let's see how we can put that into use in a variety of different ways. Well, for starters, as you saw with this image when I was demonstrating the concept of a stencil, I was simply painting into the image. Well, I can also just paint to define my real stencil with my real adjustment. So we're going to create our first targeted adjustment that actually uses a layer mask. Just keep in mind that a targeted adjustment consists of two ingredients. There's the targeted and there's the adjustment. Now we already know that the adjustment is going to be an adjustment layer. So I'll add an adjustment layer. I'll just click on the Add Adjustment Layer button at the bottom of the Layers panel and choose the type of adjustment I want to add. Let's just use Curves and then I will darken in order to create a better sky, or at least hopefully create a better sky. But as you can see, and as you probably expected, that adjustment is affecting the entire image. And that's because I have not defined a stencil. Well, not exactly, because my adjustment layer, the adjustment part of a targeted adjustment, actually came with a stencil. In this context, we call that stencil a layer mask, that is the targeted part of our targeted adjustment. And if you take a look at the layers panel up here toward the top right, you can see my layer mask. This white thumbnail is a thumbnail of my actual layer mask. Here is my actual layer mask. It is filled with white because layer masks, by default, when we add an adjustment layer, are filled with white. And that means affect this area. Remember, it's just a stencil. White means affect this area. Black means don't affect this area. So conceptually, you can probably already appreciate that if I want to target only the sky, then my stencil, my layer mask, would need to be white up on top and black down at the bottom. So for example, I could just paint on my stencil my layer mask with black to block the adjustment from the lower portion of the image. I could also start with the opposite layer mask. Perhaps, for example, I just like to paint, and I actually do, I prefer to paint the adjustment into the image rather than essentially erase the adjustment away from the image. And so I like to start with the opposite of my layer mask. So keep in mind, that layer mask is a stencil consisting of black and white pixels. It's really just an image. And just like any other image in Photoshop, I could, for example, invert it. I could go to the image menu and choose adjustments followed by invert. I could press control I on Windows or command I on Macintosh and because the layer mask for my curves adjustment layer is what is currently active so you can see that my curves layer is highlighted and if you take a look at these crop corners around the layer mask itself that indicates that the layer mask is actually active. If you weren't sure you could just click on the thumbnail for that layer mask so what I'm inverting is the layer mask. So now my layer mask, my stencil, is filled with black. If I want to paint my adjustment into the image, then I can just paint with white. So I'll just use a nice big brush here, and I can paint with white to paint my adjustment into the image. Now in this case, I started off with a slightly exaggerated tonal adjustment that is darkening up the image but keep in mind that this could be any type of adjustment. So one of the points of confusion for a lot of photographers related to layer masks is this issue of I'm painting with white, as you can see down at the bottom of the toolbox, my foreground color is currently set to white, but painting with white is darkening the image, and especially having learned about the dodge and burn technique, this seems to make no sense at all. But if we click on the thumbnail for our curves adjustment layer to get back to that curves adjustment, and if we continue working with the curves adjustment, we'll quickly see I could lighten or darken. So this is my adjustment. I'll make it an exaggerated adjustment so we can better see what's going on. There's my adjustment, and up here, my layer mask, there is my targeted. So we can see the stencil. Do not adjust the bottom portion of the image, but do adjust the top portion of the image, the top, well, let's call it about three quarters or so, versus the bottom quarter, or whatever percentage that might be, our stencils defining the sky, 
versus the lower portion of the image. Adjust the sky with this curves adjustment, which at the moment happens to be darkening the image, but it could be any type of adjustment layer, applying any type of adjustment, but I'm focusing whatever adjustment that might be on, in this case, just the sky based on that stencil. All right, so taking things a little bit of a step further and just quickly adding one little piece here, I can also work with shades of gray. So I'll just use kind of a quick exaggerated example here. Let's assume that I want to darken up the sky a bit. You can see when I darken up the sky to the point that I'm happy with the sky, the shadows look super dark, not good at all. The bright areas of the rocks here look uh, good, but they're too dark, so I want less of an adjustment there. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at how we can apply a variable adjustment to different areas of the photo. I'll start off once again with an inverted layer mask. So I generally do start this way. Apply an exaggerated adjustment, and then with my layer mask set to black, I can paint with white to reveal the adjustment in the image. And I'm just going to do kind of a quick, I know slightly less than perfect, okay, much, much less than perfect job here but just to give you a sense. And in fact, I'll make that adjustment even more exaggerated so you can better get a sense of what's happening. So I'm applying this very strong adjustment into the sky. If I make a mistake, I can paint with black to essentially erase that adjustment in other areas of the photo. Now I want to darken down the bright areas of the rock, but not at full strength. I already know that's going to be too much. Well, remember that opacity control that we used when we were dodging and burning? I have that same control available, of course, because I'm still working with the brush tool. If I want, let's say, half the effect, I could paint at a reduced opacity. The problem is working in this way gets a little bit tricky because now if I paint over the same area multiple times, I might get an uneven effect. So instead, I'm going to think about what would happen if I painted white at a 50% opacity on a black area of my layer mask, of my stencil. Well, that would give me middle gray. Well, if I go down to the bottom of the toolbox where my color picker is and click on my foreground color, that will bring up my color picker dialog where I can specify the exact color that I want to paint with. Well, if I take a look at the H, S, B controls, that's hue, saturation, and brightness, notice that my brightness is set to 100% and that gives me white. And if I change my color to black, that gives me 0%. Well, that corresponds to my stencil. 100% or white gives me 100% of my adjustment. And 0% or black gives me 0% of my adjustment. So if I dial in 50% to give myself 50% gray, now when I paint, I'm having half the effect. So I can essentially dial in the percentage of effect I want to have on specific areas. If I decide that's too strong, I can just undo, go back to my color picker. Let's assume I want about a 25% effect in that area, and now I'm just toning down those highlights just a little bit. So not only can I use black and white on my layer mask, on my stencil, I can also use shades of gray to have a variable effect on different areas of the image. And of course, in addition to painting, doing all this hard work, we can also use a selection as the basis of our targeted adjustment of our layer mask. And so just quickly, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we have an entire video course in the Gray Learning Library that relates to creating selections in Photoshop using a wide variety of tools and commands and techniques. But I just want to give you a little bit of a taste. If we're using, for example, the Quick Selection tool, my favorite tool, I can create a selection very quickly and easily. No wonder they called it the Quick Selection tool. I generally want to make sure on the options bar that my sample all layers setting is turned on, and generally I want the Auto Enhance option turned on as well. And the basic idea here is I can click in the image and drag across the area that I want to select so that I'm creating a selection of that portion of the photo. Well, that wasn't too difficult at all, was it? The thing is, that wasn't necessarily the easiest way for me to create the selection. I want to adjust the rock here, but it sometimes is faster and easier to create the selection of what you don't want. So I'll deselect here, for example. 
by choosing select D select from the menu or pressing control D on Windows command D on Macintosh and if I start over I can just sweep across the sky in half a second I have essentially the exact same selection just the opposite so keep in mind that in some cases it's easier to create the opposite of the selection that you want I do highly encourage you to explore the quick selection tool as a great starting point for those selections keeping in mind of course there are a wide variety of other options available and then when you have the opposite of what you wanted we can simply go to the select menu and then choose modify or sorry modify that was something else we were going to talk about we can go to the select menu and choose inverse in order to invert that selection but we also have a keyboard shortcut of control shift I on Windows or command shift I on Macintosh so once I have the selection of the foreground the rocky area of the photo now how do I take this stencil this selection and use it as my other stencil my layer mask for my targeted adjustment well it's very simple remember that when we add an adjustment layer it comes with that stencil that layer mask automatically well if I have a selection active that stencil that layer mask will match the shape of my selection so I'll go ahead and just for example add a curves adjustment and you can see on the layers panel here my stencil matches the shape of the selection and my adjustment sure enough is only affecting the area that I had selected so pretty quick and easy create a selection add an adjustment layer and you have a very quick targeted adjustment but what about those more tricky scenarios well one solution is to never photograph anything fuzzy anything with hair feathers fur these are the challenges we face when it comes to targeted adjustments but there are also some other options that enable us to work with these tricky scenarios so I'm going to show you two basic techniques here to add to your portfolio of tips and tricks for targeted adjustments one is creating a selection based on a color channel I could certainly use a variety of different selection techniques but I find that in many cases using one of my color channels as the basis of a selection can be a very fast shortcut to a good selection so I could try using the quick selection tool here I could try to use color range but I found that one of the channels is often a good starting point especially if there's good color contrast in the photo so I'm gonna to go to the channels panel if you don't have the channels panel visible in Photoshop you can go to the window menu and choose channels to bring that up or if you do have it visible just click on the tab so that you can go view your channels by default we're looking at the RGB tile at the overall full color image but I can also click on the red channel to take a look at just that channel click on the thumbnail for the green channel click on the thumbnail for the blue channel and look at what we have here we have to use a little bit of imagination but this is a pretty good starting point for my stencil if I could just darken up the background and lighten up the foreground I'd be in pretty good shape well, that actually corresponds more or less to darkening the darks and lightening the light so let's take a look at how we can accomplish that here first off I do not want to work directly on one of my color channels the red green or the blue channel that would affect the overall color in the image the blue channel for example is defining where blue light is visible and to what extent and the red green and blue light all add up to our individual colors so I need a copy of my blue channel to get started I'll go ahead and drag the thumbnail for that blue channel down to the create new well in this case channel rather than layer so that blank sheet of paper icon at the bottom of the channels panel now I have a blue copy this happens to be called now an alpha channel so we have our channels red green and blue our color bearing channels now I've added an extra channel and those extra channels are referred to as alpha channels in part because they can affect visibility in the image in other words we can use them as a stencil so now I want to darken the darks and brighten the brights I'm going to go to the image menu and choose adjustments followed by levels I could also use a keyboard shortcut for that of course and then I'll drag my white point inward in order to brighten up the whites and my black point inward in order to darken up the darks let's go ahead and zoom in and make sure we're not going to create too much of a problem for the fur I don't mind losing a tiny bit of fur detail but I don't want to lose much so maybe right about there seems to be a good adjustment 
Perhaps I can use that mid-tone. Well, I'm getting a good result. I'm pretty happy with this result for the fur, but you can see that I still have some areas of the background that are problematic, but this seems to be about as good as I can do. So I'll go ahead and click OK, and that was pretty good, but not perfect. Well, I can clean this up pretty easily. So if I choose my brush tool once again, and then paint with black in this background, I can clean up all of this clutter. Well, that's fine when I'm staying nice and far from the macaque, but let's zoom in a little bit. And even though I'm using a soft edged brush, if I try to clean up this area, as I start to paint too close, I'm obliterating that fur detail. So I'll undo that stroke. If only there were a way to darken up this area without having too much of an effect on the fur, well, there is. I can use that blend mode. Remember the dodging and burning that we were doing earlier? I can dodge and burn right here. So keep in mind that when we're working with an alpha channel, a layer mask, even a selection, what we are essentially working with is just a black and white image. And we can use all of the various tools in Photoshop to affect that image. So I'll go ahead and choose the overlay blend mode, this time working with the brush itself. And now I can paint, and I'm painting with black at a full strength, so I'm able to get rid of those gray areas on my black background. And if I paint over the fur, yes, of course, I'm going to affect it to some extent, but I won't affect the white areas at all. And so I'm having a much less problematic effect on that fur so that I can clean up any of those additional details without having a significant impact on the fur itself. So I'll go ahead and clean that up. I'll switch to white and I'll do the same basic thing on the interior here. I could use probably a little bit of a stronger adjustment with that levels adjustment initially, but we won't worry about that right now. I'll just go ahead and clean up a path around the outer edge, once again, having minimal effect on that fur edge detail. Once I have kind of a boundary defined around that outside, then I can use one of my other selection tools in order to create a selection of the interior areas. I won't take the extra time to make this absolutely perfect. You get the idea. We'll clean up that bottom portion separately. And continuing around relatively quickly. There we go. And filling that with white. Now, at least in concept, obviously I have some more work to do down at the bottom, but let's assume that this is a good starting point for us in any event. I'll go ahead then and use that blue copy alpha channel as the basis of a selection. To do that, I will hold the control key on Windows, command key on Macintosh, and click on the thumbnail for my blue copy. I could also click this little circular dashed button to load that channel as a selection. So now I have a selection. I'll click on my RGB tile to get back to my full color image. I'll go back to the layers panel and add an adjustment. I'll go ahead and just add a curves adjustment to exaggerate the effect here. And I'll go ahead and apply a relatively strong adjustment so we can see what's going on. That's the opposite of what I wanted. I created a selection for the macaque. I actually want the adjustment to affect the background. So I'll invert that layer mask and then come back to my adjustment. And actually, I'll go ahead and do a little tiny bit of cleanup work here for this bottom portion of the image. So I'll just paint with black on that tree stump down at the bottom to get rid of the adjustment itself. I'm still set to the overlay blend mode, so I'll set that back to normal and just clean up those various areas. So obviously not exactly 100% perfect, but hopefully that helps to illustrate that concept that I can use a couple of techniques, a channel-based selection combined with that dodging and burning on my alpha channel or on the layer mask itself in order to clean up that result so that I can have a targeted adjustment even in those furry areas. And speaking of challenging furry areas, we'll take a look at, in this case, a fuzzy little bird. So I want to apply an adjustment, in this case, to the sky. Very simple and straightforward, all things considered. So I'll go ahead and just create a selection, except with quick selection, you'll see that I'm missing these non-contiguous areas. I could paint in those additional areas. Instead, I'll just deselect and switch to my magic wand tool. And here I can click into an area of the image. I generally use a moderately low tolerance value up here on the options bar, somewhere around 8 or 16. 
and then I'll simply click in the image in the area that I want to select, in this case the sky, and then hold the shift key and click in additional areas of the sky until I feel that I have a good selection. Then I can apply an adjustment, so once again we'll just use an exaggerated curves adjustment and we see that we're able to darken the sky without affecting the bird here, the lilac breasted roller. But if we zoom in, we start to find some problems. My selection was less than perfect, so I want to feather the selection, no pun intended of course. On my properties panel, I could switch from the adjustment to the mask and then increase the value for feather and you'll see that that's helping to smooth out that edge of my adjustment of my layer mask but now I'm getting a halo because my mask essentially is moved too far away from the bird well I'm just gonna leave that option alone set that feathering back down to zero and then click the select and mask button here and that will bring up in the case of Photoshop CC 2017 and 2015.5 I believe was the version that first added this option now we get this whole workspace if you're using an earlier version you'll have the same basic controls just organized into a dialog that pops up instead so you can't see as much of the image necessarily but either way the same adjustments are available and they work great so once again I can feather I still do want to feather but I'm getting that halo of course as I expected well, if I scroll down just a little bit more, I'll find my shift edge control. I can shift that edge, so I'll drag over toward the right to shift the edge of my mask inward into the bird or outward away from the bird. And so I can work to fine tune, trying to find exactly the right values to use for both my feathering and my edge shift using that shift edge slider so that I can get the adjustment lined up perfectly with the edge of the bird versus the sky in this case. So maybe pull that in just a little bit tighter, maybe somewhere around there. That seems to be a pretty good starting point. Everything looks per oh, everything was looking pretty good until I scrolled around within the image and now I found some chin feathers here that are still causing a problem. Well, over on the toolbar here, this tool that's active by default enables me to refine the edge of that mask just by painting over this area, essentially telling Photoshop to kind of smooth that area out a little bit. And you can see it's now blended that area away, so I've got a much smoother transition. Still a little bit of an adjustment on the feathers. I think that'll work out okay. I'll go ahead and click okay. And we'll see if I zoom out, keep in mind, this adjustment was very, very strong. If I apply a more reasonable adjustment, then that fine tune, that refined mask actually works out very, very nicely. All right, so there you have some of my very favorite techniques. I know we have some questions here, so I'll address some of those questions. Uh, let's take a look here. So. Uh, can we show how to use the eyedroppers? Yes, except then you have to accept the caveat that I don't really like using the eyedroppers, but I will explain what they do here. If we were working with curves or levels, for example, uh, and a variety of other adjustments, you'll see that we have some eyedroppers. In the context of curves or levels, we have a black midtone and white eyedropper. I can click the white eyedropper and then hmm, click in an area of the image that should be white and then click the black eyedropper and where should be black maybe down in there and then I can choose the gray eyedropper and click in an area of the image that I think should be perfectly neutral and the color will be adjusted accordingly these controls can be very helpful if you have for example the X-ray color checker passport in the frame these can be very helpful for setting a black and white point plus your neutral point your overall color balance very quickly and easily. In the context of most photographic images though, it can be a little bit of a challenge. Not exactly the easiest way to work. Uh, easy certainly, but not necessarily the, more, the most accurate way. Uh, let's see, why didn't the blue adjustment affect, ah, the mountain and sky, that would be coming back to this image of the Duomo in Florence, Italy. So when I was working with the curves adjustment, working on an individual channel, the question here is why wasn't the sky in the background affected and actually 
it was being affected uh, through a little bit of misdirection I suppose because I was talking so much about the Duomo versus the shadows but if you take a look when I turn off the adjustment on versus off you'll see that there is a little bit of an adjustment there the main reason that we're not seeing much of an adjustment relates to the fact that that background area is mostly mid-tones and so based on the shape of the curve here that area is getting the least adjustment Ah, so, really good question. So if the magic is happening on the layer for the mode, why not change the opacity on the layer as well instead of the brush? So if I change the opacity for my adjustment layer, I can reduce the opacity for the layer itself. That will tone down the overall adjustment. And similarly with our dodge and burn technique that we saw earlier, if I reduce the opacity for the layer itself, the overall effect gets reduced. Sometimes that's exactly what you want. Let's say, for example, I got a little bit exaggerated here and my color balance adjustment was too strong. Instead of trying to find just the right values for my curves adjustment to make it better, I could simply reduce the opacity setting for that layer in order to reduce the strength of that adjustment that got a little bit out of hand. Uh, great question from Terry. Can these same techniques be done in Lightroom? And yes, I would say that many of these techniques can be performed in Lightroom. Not necessarily all of them, but most of them. And there's, of course, variations. So, for example, when I was using these targeted adjustments, we can use the adjustment brush to paint an adjustment into specific areas. And so there are ways that we can apply most of these same concepts inside of Lightroom for sure. And then is adjusting the flow rate the same as adjusting shades of gray? And I would say that no, that's not exactly the same. The flow can be thought of kind of like an airbrush technique. It allows us to have a paintbrush effect build up over time, essentially, as we're painting in the same area. And so there is some similarity, also similar to opacity in many respects. Uh, and so you can certainly, those techniques that I was showing you where I'm painting with shades of gray on the layer mask, those same techniques can be applied, as I mentioned, the opacity control, but also with that flow control, but that will give me a variable effect in certain areas, and that can sometimes be problematic. Uh, Robert's got a question here about the halo. So we saw that with the bird. So maybe this question predated the bird there, the lilac-breasted roller shot. But can we control for the halos? And that would be primarily accomplished by fine-tuning the edge of that mask, getting the feathering just right, and then shifting that edge just right inward versus outward. Sometimes, this is the unpleasant truth about targeted adjustments, sometimes we just have to zoom in really close and use a tiny little brush and paint on tiny little areas to clean up our mask. But I would say that, that with the various techniques I've shown you today, hopefully most of the time you can avoid those various issues. All right. so. Thank you all very much. We had one other question about Photoshop 2017, best adjustments, best new features there. And I would say in the context of targeted adjust adjustments, there's not anything there of significance. Uh, maybe the best big feature that's sort of interesting and definitely a lot of fun would be the new face feature for the liquify adjustment. So you might take a look at that. And do look for a follow-up email as well, featuring some special discounts on some of the courses that we talked about in the Gray Learning Video Training Library. As I mentioned, there are a couple of courses in particular, Mastering Selections as well as Targeted Adjustments for Photoshop that go far beyond what we had time to cover here today with some additional techniques. So I encourage you to take a look at those. Again, if you are already signed up for the Gray Learning Everything Bundle, then you have access to every single course that gets added to the Gray Learning Library. So do check your email tomorrow for a special offer on some of those video courses. In the meantime, thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. Thank you to XRite for hosting the webinar. I hope that you found all of the tips and techniques today very helpful as you continue to master targeted adjustments for your photos. Thank you all very much.